you have your Bibles with you, you can open them up to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And I don't know what's going to be, we're going to be able to get on the screens and not on the screens, you're just going to have to follow along. All right? We began at the beginning of this month a series on radical love, what it really means to love. And we've been learning that God's kind of love is different, alien, foreign to the human nature, the human love that we experience in the world today. Human love is based on attraction. I want you, so I'm going to love you. Uh, It's based on what we can get selfishly. I'm going to uh, act loving towards you so I can get something back for myself. We love because other people love us. We love because people have been good to us. But the Bible says that God's love is revealed in this, that while we were still sinners, still offensive to him, still uh, in a place where we were alienated from God, when we weren't looking for him, we weren't wanting him, we weren't seeking him, he loved us and sent his son to die for us. And the Bible says that if we are going to walk in the real power of God's God's anointing in our lives. We've got to walk in the God kind of love. The love that isn't based on what I can get from you. It's based on something in me that wants to reach out and do something for you. Regardless of how you look, we sometimes call it unconditional love. It's not conditioned on what you can do for me. It's just, I love you, period. Amen. And so that kind of love is the love that God calls us to, to, to uh, operate in, and it's really the, the, the atmosphere of Christianity. It, and, and everything else in the Christian faith, all the principles and the prescribed behavior, uh, uh, you know, behavior rules and conduct laws as we think of them, all of them just become so much uh, just empty legalistic uh, formulas if we don't understand the love of God. The the gospel and even church can become a hard, unhappy, hard place if we don't understand that living the Christian lifestyle must come out of the environment, the air of the love of God. Not human love, God's love. A love that goes beyond where we as humans would normally be able to love. And so we're learning what that love looks like, sounds like, and feels like, and what the Bible promises for those who walk in this incredible promise of love. Last week we saw that forgiveness is a very important aspect of love, and that forgiveness is a liberating force. It liberates us from the offenses that keep us bound and bitter because of the poor behavior, perceived or otherwise, of someone else against us. And when we forgive, it's the greatest gift that we can give ourselves. And this week, I'm going to talk to you about something that's even a little more important or just builds on what we've been saying, and that is this, that love not only liberates you from offense, but the love of God is your cover. It is your protection. And so I want to talk to you about love cover. Just say that with me, love cover. You know, when it's raining out, you want to get under cover, right? When it's, uh, the weather is bad, when there's lightning and there's thunder, you, they tell you get under safety, get under cover. Uh, cover is protection. Cover keeps the, the fury that's outside from affecting you inside. Uh, covering not only is protection, covering is also safety, When we're under the proper covering, we are safe. The Bible has a lot to say about positioning ourselves under covering. For one thing, when we when we live in a good relationship with God and we, we live in a love and in a, in a, an obedient relationship to God, we hide under the covering of God's love and protection. Psalm 91 is all about how God promises to protect and, and bless us in this life if we live under the protection of His covering. The Bible tells us that when God created marriage, He designed it to create a covering for the man and the woman. A home is, in a sense, a covering. When a wife takes a husband, she comes under the covering of the husband and the husband and wife together become the covering of a family to protect and keep their children. It's in that cover that God wants families to be raised. 
uh, the Bible tells us that when we become Christians, we're under the covering of Jesus and that Jesus raises up local churches and shepherds that are supposed to watch out for us spiritually and provide a covering. Christians that aren't committed members of local churches are outside of a very important protective cover that God designed for them, and God wants every Christian to live in. In, uh, live under that protection. There's something about being in a committed relationship. When I say committed, it means you're not just occasionally going. There's no commitment, but you make a commitment to be in a vibrant part of a local church under the spiritual leadership of the pastor or pastoral team, the shepherds that God has placed there. There is a covering. There's a protection there. And so many people today, even those who are members sometimes of the church, don't understand how to access by faith the spiritual protection and covering that comes when you're in relationship with a local church that's following God and listening to the Holy Spirit. It's so important to be under the right cover. When you're not under cover, you are susceptible to becoming exposed to enemies, to danger, uh, and very often we can, if we're not properly covered, we can unconsciously expose ourselves to threats. And the enemy will go after sheep who are not under cover. He will go after people who aren't under the proper cover. And one of the things the devil wants us to do is to get out of the coverings that God has provided for us by uh, moving out of relationship with the sources of those coverings. And one of the most important areas, and maybe the, the presiding concept of cover in the Bible, is the idea of the covering of walking in love, the love of God. And that doesn't just include with those different uh, agencies of covering that I talked about. That includes with your brother, with your sister, and even with people that have set themselves against you. Love is a protection. And so we're going to look at the covering of love. In Romans 12, it gives us this radical prescription for loving people who are actively attacking us. And that's why it's important to realize love is not how I treat, feel, or think about someone whom I like, someone whom I'm getting along with, someone whom I naturally feel loving towards. Walking in love isn't really necessary when you already love somebody. Walking in love in the New Testament is always prescribed when you are hurt, offended, or in some kind of a, of, of a challenge where your flesh would want to respond with vindictiveness, with vengeance, with, with words or actions to get justice for yourself. And the Bible says in those cases, don't do that. Instead, this is where you have an opportunity to walk in love. I've heard people say, well, you know, I, I walk in love most of the time, but in this situation, I just have to, I just have to get, you know, get this out there. I've just got to deal with this. I've got to make this person understand how much they've hurt me. What they're actually saying is, I really um, have never really walked in love, but I have a situation now where I have an opportunity to walk in radical love, and I'm going to not do it. Again, walking in radical love is really not defined by how you treat people you like or already love and have no problem with. It's defined in the New Testament by how you interact with people when you have a problem with them. So turn to somebody and say, you could be my opportunity to walk in love. <laughs> tell somebody that. All right. Now remember, in Romans 12, he began in verse 9 by saying, don't pretend to love, really love each other. And in verse 14, he says this, listen, Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Who are you supposed to bless? People who are what? Persecuting you. Re verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all people, if it's possible, as much as it depends on you. You can't take their end of the equation, only your own. Live at peace with all people. Be peaceable. You be peaceable. Whether they are or not, it's up to them. Verse 19. Beloved, don't take vengeance for yourselves, but leave room for wrath. In other words, don't try in your own flesh and, and anger to, make, to get justice for someone that's hurt or offended or wronged you, but leave some room for God. Let God handle the vengeance business. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, say the Lord. Who is the one that's in the justice business? God. We are in the love business. God's the only one that can meet out justice perfectly and with absolute balance of grace and truth. 
Verse 20, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So this is telling us that there are strategies for actively, actively uh, dealing with offenses, hurts, and injustices that come against us. And I want you to notice all of these strategies have nothing to do with you suing somebody, you yelling at somebody, you just telling somebody off, you talking about somebody. None of these strategies have to do with you doing something to get justice for yourself or in a way uh, defending yourself by exposing their bad behavior. It all has to do with something totally opposite of the way, the way we think today in the Western world. And it really is what defines us about whether or not we walk in love. Now what we have to remember as we read these words is that God is not prescribing something that doesn't already exist in him and that he hasn't already demonstrated graciously towards us. As we pointed out, while we were still sinners, God sent Jesus to die for us. And Jesus, who was being abused, beaten, spit upon, unjustly, accused at a trial of all kinds of things he was not guilty of, the Bible says he opened not his mouth to defend himself. He didn't uh, try to uh, get back or fight as they were uh, unfairly taking advantage of him, but he trusted himself to the God who judges righteously. And the ultimate example of this kind of love is when Jesus was being nailed to the cross, his body lacerated from the beatings of the Romans under the authority of the Jewish, the Jewish uh, high priests. And the very people who were taking his life and in injuring the sinless son of God were gambling over his clothes. They weren't saying, we're really feeling regretful about this. We're sorry. I'm sorry. I hurt nothing. No apology, no repentance, no sense of even them either, uh, guilt whatsoever. And while they're still actively attacking him, Jesus prays for them and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Then while he's hanging on the cross, a man next to him who was, a, who was a sinner who was being righteously punished turns to him and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he tells him that his faith had saved him and that today you will be with me in paradise. And he does something for this man. He forgives his sins. He acts on the behalf of someone who didn't deserve to have this action performed. This is the kind of love that is supposed to be the primary core ethos of Christianity. And that means we need to inculcate it if we're really going to reach the world. We're not going to reach the world by using the world's methods. We've got to use these methods. And this isn't just a prescription for some denominations and churches. It doesn't matter what your denominational level is or whether you're non-denominational or wherever you Every believer is called to live according to these precepts that Paul describes as love. Now, I want you to notice something that he says at the end of this verse very quickly. He said that when you do these strategic things for others who are attacking you, you actually heap coals of fire on their head. Now, this is an interesting statement. It's a direct quote from Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. And in Proverbs 25, 21 and 22, this is an Old Testament verse. Listen to what the Old Testament says. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Interesting. Now, in the ancient world, this, and this is the way it is with Hebrew. I'm learning more and more about this in my seminary training. And as I took Hebrew class, I was amazed at the intricacy of the Old Testament language. Hebrew is such a language that it not only has an obvious meaning, but it has layers of meaning that are intentionally written into the text. There are these uh, structures called chiasms, which means you can read it four words. There's a statement, another statement, and then a conclusion, and then a, a, another statement, and another conclusion, and you can read it forwards or backwards, and it means the same thing. Or sometimes 
It's written in such a way that if you read it one way, it means one thing, but if you read it the other way, it means something else. Listen, and you might say, well, you're saying there's multiple meanings to the text. Yes, intentionally. Sometimes God means multiple things. And what's so amazing about the Bible and the Hebrew Old Testament, and some of this you only get when you, when you can read it in Hebrew, but I can describe it for you, is that it's into the text, there's all of these, these meanings that work either way. In the Western world, we think this way. Uh, we think this or that. This is true, that means that cannot be true. And there is, there is, uh, there is an important reality to that. Sometimes two things cannot be true about the same thing in the same relationship at the same time. Uh, we cannot say it is both day and night in the same place at the same time in the same way. We can say it is day and night if we uh, don't think of it in the same place at the same time. In other words, it is day here, it is night in Japan, right? So the statement it is day is true, but the statement it is night is also true, but not in the same way. But you could also say it is both day and night because it is right now day on this side of the world, and it's night on the other side of the world, right? This statement is also true, uh, none of the above. Because if you back out and you leave the planet and you're no longer on the surface that is rotating under the sun, you will see that in space, it's neither day nor night. That's only a reality for where we are. So depending on where you're located, the statement it is day is true, the statement it is night is true, the statement it is day and night is true, and the statement none of the above is true. Sometimes we think that somebody's wrong when actually they're right, but they're on another, from another perspective. And as long as you're arguing it is night, I can look outside, I see the moon. And you're talking on the phone to somebody else, and they're saying, it is day, I'm looking outside, and I can see the sun, and you're wrong, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong. What God's wanting to do is put you in the spaceship of his word and elevate you up so you can see his perspective, because sometimes you'll understand you're right and you're wrong. And most conflicts, there is a truth that the parties in conflict are not seeing. And only God in his spirit can elevate us up to get the full perspective a lot of times. So that's why we need to understand that sometimes in the Bible, something is true this way and that way. So it's not always this or that. Sometimes it's this and that. So this word, I said all that to say this, where it says, you will heap coals of fire in his head in Romans 12. It's a quotation from the Old Testament that says, uh, it's, well, it's rendered usually the same way. You shall heap coals of fire on his head. But it's the Hebrew word chata, chata, which means, you had to kind of do that. Chata, and it means every time it's used in the Old Testament to snatch away fire, to pick up fire or to pick it up and pull it away. One time it's used of a man, but it typically has to do with snatching up. However, in some contexts, it can mean to quickly take fire and put it in a pile. So it can mean both snatch up fire or heap up fire. So which one is right? Well, in Romans 12, the Apostle Paul uses the, uses the Greek word that would indicate to heap up coals of fire. But back in, in the Hebrew, it's the word that intentionally means both. So what is God saying? Well, here's the deal. When we walk in active love strategies towards people that have been offensive or offending us, we are both heaping up coals of fire and snatching them away. Let me show, share it with you. In one sense, coals of fire upon someone's head could represent, and often did in the ancient world, a conviction for wrongdoing, a sense of guilt for having done something wrong. And when someone has offended and hurt you, and you continuously act lovingly towards them, you actually heap up uh, coals of conviction upon their head and guilt. You build their sense of guilt, which ultimately could lead to their repentance. In another way, coals of fire can represent judgment. So as you walk in love towards that person and don't try to avenge yourself, you actually are leaving space for God to judge and properly bring justice in the person's life. That is also true. But in another way, this Hebrew word can mean snatch away coals of fire. 
And when you're loving somebody else, you're not only covering and protecting your own heart and your own life, but you're actually doing something for that person. Because as you love them, you're snatching judgment from them. And as they feel convicted, and as they begin to get remorse for their sin, your love towards them can actively deliver them from their blindness and, br- and snatch the coals of judgment from their head, which is true. It's all true. It's all true. So whether we're heaping up coals of conviction or snatching away judgment, the point is, when we walk in love, it is a strategy that not only frees us, it actually perfectly allows God to do whatever he, in his perfect wisdom, thinks is right for that person or situation. Hallelujah. This is good preaching whether you know it or not. All right. I'm blessing myself right now. Now, love is a cover that protects us. And I just want to give this to you. In 1 Peter 4, 8, the Bible says this, And above all, above all things, have fervent, the word fervent means burning, burning love for one another. For love will, say it with me, cover, what? A multitude of sins. Now, Peter is quoting from the Old Testament. Again, the the Old Testament is filled with the love and the mercy of God. You just have to understand how the New Testament writers used it. The Bible talks about love covering sin. In Proverbs 10, 12, the Bible says in the Old Testament, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sin. And in Proverbs 17, 9, he who covers a transgression seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates friends. Notice, there's a conflict. And if you tell someone else about the conflict, if you you spread it by by the human impulse to gossip or to get it off your chest, you can actually cause a destruction of relationships. You spread the conflict to someone else. But when you're walking in love and you know somebody is doing or has done something inappropriate and you don't repeat the matter, you keep it between yourself and God, you not only don't divide relationships, but you cover many sins. Sometimes what Satan wants to do is not only perpetrate his sin through someone against someone else, but then his goal is to use that over and over again to offend That's why I say to people who've been abused, even as children, unjustly and unrighteously, that everything that was done to you was wrong and sinful and and, and and, and should be, uh, you you should know that. You should not feel guilty for what someone else has done to you when you were not inviting it in any way, shape, or form. And you need to be free of any personal guilt. And you need to know that what they did is wrong. But the other side of it is, God, if we'll walk in love and we won't continuously just stir it up all the time, uh, it gives God an opportunity to not only judge that person, and he will do it in perfect timing and in a perfect way, or help that person be delivered because the ultimate goal would not only be for that person to suffer for what they've done, but for that person to repent for what they've done and be reunited to God because their sin against you is a sin against God and is actually hurting them. And so as Christians, we don't just look at the, the wickedness performed by people that we despise like ISIS. I don't know about you, but I have a real distaste for the behavior of that group. And there's something in me that gets really excited when I hear about a bomb going off and, you know, some killers getting justice. I'm just being honest with you. I'm just being straight. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying there's something. Yes, right? But as a Christian, I've got to even go beyond wanting justice, The highest goal is to understand that the wickedness that they're doing is a sin against us, against God, but against them, and that Jesus even died for those wicked people. And if I think I'm so much morally superior to them that I don't have enough love to pray for their salvation, then I'm not walking in the love of God. Because the murderers who, be- who betrayed and 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 persecuted and abused and killed Jesus received the prayers and the forgiveness and the love of God. And it ultimately brought redemption to countless people in the Roman Empire and to 
into hundreds of thousands of Jewish people who didn't know Jesus or God's love. Praise the Lord. So ultimately, we need to do more than pray for justice. We need to pray, yes, for evil to stop, for those things to be exposed, but we also need to include in our prayer, Father, we pray that those people who are so deceived by Satan, listen, people who do that, they are demonized. They are, they are lied to. They're believing a lie. That they will have a revelation of the love of God and God save them. And here's the thing. If somebody like that gets saved and comes to church, would you sit next to them? Would you have them over? What if, now this doesn't, this doesn't seem real in this culture, but this is real in some parts of the world. What if that person had actually done something against your own family? I just saw a wonderful testimony. It was actually a secular video story of uh, a woman who in the Rwandan massacre, when the Hutus and the Tutsis uh, began to uh, attack each other and one tribe wiped out a million people in six days. This one woman lost her entire family to a particular group of men that uh, invaded their home and uh, put her into slavery, raped her, and then took her husband and children and marched them off a cliff to their deaths. Later, when peace came, she was a Christian. God began to deal with her, and uh, she actually realized she needed to forgive, and so she sat down with the man, one of the men who was guilty and was dealing with all kinds of guilt afterwards because he was possessed by this mob spirit. You've got to be careful who you hang out with because the spirit that's on others can get on you. You've got to be careful what Facebook groups you join, what chat rooms you hang out in. If it's not, if, if people are just angry all the time, you need to be careful how much you diet on angry rhetoric. And they sat down together, and one of the most remarkable things is that this man asked for her forgiveness for killing her husband and children. He actually could tell her what happened, how they behaved right up to the end. And she sat there, and she, by faith, I think, forgave him. And now they're actually friends, and they have coffee or tea together uh, a couple times a week. And he, they help each other. Now, how can you do that? Unless there's a love that supersedes the limitations of our humanity. You say, well, that's a wonderful story, but could you do that? Would you do it? Because to the extent that you can say yes, honestly, is the extent to which you've grown, you're grown in the love of God. Because that's the highest level. People think that walking in faith and having gifts of the Spirit is an indication of spiritual maturity. It is not. In fact, the Bible says you can have faith that actually moves mountains. You can have the gift of faith. You can speak and things change. You can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You can have knowledge, the word of knowledge operating where you know things and prophesy all things. And if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. Paul said that love is more important than spiritual power gifts. And in chapter 14, he says this, Therefore, pursue, run after love and desire spiritual gifts. In other words, don't covet spiritual gifts or power and try to add love to it. Pursue love and then desire spiritual gifts secondarily. So love is more important than power. Turn to somebody and say, loving you is more important than how powerful I can get. Okay. And love is a covering. Satan is a divider of relationships. He wants to stir up strife. But love will cover. Now, love covers in a couple of ways. Love not only protects and covers us, love covers other people and protects them. The Bible talks about love covering, this idea of love covering really from the book of Genesis, an early biblical story that all the people who quote this, all the writers of the Bible quote this, are thinking of this story. The Bible says that Noah, the one who saved the human race by building an ark, after his great victory, planted a vineyard, and became uh, a drinker. And it actually exposes the fact that he was, he was excessively drinking and became drunk. 
which was, which was not the will of God. And so Noah was drunk, he's in his tent, he didn't have any clothes on, and his one son comes in, sees him naked, and walks away and laughs and scoffs and tells his brothers, yeah, dad's drunk again in the tent. His other two brothers were honorable. And so they came in, the Bible says they, they walked in backwards with a robe, they didn't even want to see their father's nakedness, they didn't want to look at it, and they covered his nakedness and then walked back out without looking at him. And when Noah came to himself, when he got over his drunken stupor, he realized that his first son had dishonored him and exposed his nakedness, while his second sons covered it. And the Bible says that Noah put a curse on one son and blessed the other two. And I'm going to say that there's something metaphoric about this, that when we seek to cover, when we know somebody has fallen or stumbled or is exposed because of their own behavior, they've stumbled, when we just look at it and then go and tell somebody else, can you believe what so-and-so did? Hmm. We actually are invoking a curse on our lives. But when someone tells us about someone else's sin and we make a decision to shut up and to actually try to cover it, not cover up. There's a difference between a cover-up. A cover-up is trying to hide a crime to evade justice. This isn't what we're talking about. But covering it, not allowing the sin to continue, the story, the news to continue to spread and cause disruption to a person's reputation. Covering it, not even looking at it, just covering it up. The Bible says that's love. Love covers a multitude of sins. You see, when we walk in love towards others using these strategies, we actually are keeping their sin from furthering its injury to other people. And sometimes, folks, the most important thing for you to do when you've been hurt and offended or you've heard about someone else's sin or nakedness is to use the incredible strategy of shutting your mouth. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is shut up. Don't repeat it. Don't post it. Don't look for somebody else who's posted it and then share it. Because when you share someone else's nakedness, you're actually causing that person to have to bear the brunt of their offense of what they've done. And sometimes people can't handle it. When you're offended with somebody, if they've actually hurt you, you need to talk to them about it if it's possible and try to resolve it. And if it's not resolvable, you give it to the Lord. But when you tell two or three people, you're actually just perpetrating the offense and it's living again and again and again. See, Satan doesn't want to just hurt you by causing you to be hurt and offended by someone else's abuse or behavior. He wants to keep that abuse and let it have a life so that it, it lives in your memory. And every time you tell it, it re-injures you. It re-injures others. We think that by telling it, we actually heal it. It's like pulling a scab off a wound. It just takes longer to heal. Some of you have wounds that you've been pulling the scabs off of for years. And just about the time it gets healed, something happens to remind you of what they did, and you have to talk about it. And what you need to do is apply the strategies of love and not continuously repeat the sin. You need to cover it and let it heal. Turn to somebody and say, cover it up. Cover it up with the love of God. Whew. Love is a shield of protection. And so let's look at some of these strategies. We're going to go to Luke real quick because we're going to see that what Paul says is actually a repetition of what Jesus taught in Luke. In Luke 6, 27, Jesus said this, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Love your enemies, and then he gives us three things. Do good, bless, and pray for. Verse 35 says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And he said, your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. So if there are people in your life that have wounded you, and they are unthankful and evil, this applies to you. This is what you do, not them. How many of you would say at some point in your life you've had people that are ungrateful and evil? in the way they've acted. Anybody besides me? Okay. He's saying, if you want to be like God, then you are kind to the unthankful and evil people in your life. Because that's what God does. God is actually, he makes his rain fall on the farms of the just and the unjust. 
He lets his light and his air shine and breathe uh, for the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. And you want to be a son of your father? Be kind to unthankful and evil people. And he says, notice, your reward will be great. The word reward is in the Greek, mythos, which means your payback, your salary, the wages that are due you. In other words, when you walk in these aggressive love strategies towards offensive, hurtful, unthankful, and unkind people, you are laying up, you're actually paying, you're working, and God is going to reward you personally. In fact, it says your mythos will be great, megas, it's going to be enormous. The payback in your life is going to be immense when you love not the people you like. Your enemies, your, the unthankful, the evil, the people who are mistreating you, abusing you, ignoring you, have hurt you, present or past, when you do these things, you actually build up a megas payback salary from God. And that salary will certainly include the next life, but folks, the word here, mythos, really refers to practical wages. It indicates in this life, you're going to get paid back. And if the payback is nothing other than you don't walk around continuously wounded and victimized, that's worth it. You may have been victimized, but you have a choice whether you're going to accept the identity of a victim. God wants you to rise above victimhood. Amen? It's okay to be honest about what's happened to the right people at the right time, but you need to get healed from that. And after you have properly expressed that and gotten, and gotten it out, now you need to start actively walking in the love of God. So let's take a look. Three things. Number one, he says, Jesus said, Paul said, pray for them. Everybody say pray for. Praying for them is not just praying for them to get their just rewards. God, let them experience every pain they've caused me. In the Old Testament, David did pray this way, but under the new covenant, we have a higher law, the law of love, and Jesus did not do that. And we're called to walk and love others as Jesus loved us, right? So when we, we pray the prayers of David in the Psalms, and it's talking about enemies, instead of picturing people, picture the enemy, Satan. Because if people are acting improperly and evil, it's because they're actually under the deception of the enemy. If they really knew what they were doing, if they saw everything and they were free from their sin, they would, they would, uh, they would feel shame. So, so people who are perpetually evil are actually blind. They believe lies. And the real enemy is not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. That's a demonic entity that's operating in human systems. Praise the Lord. When you pray for others who are hurting you and pray for God to bless them or for God to, be, uh, to, to, to uh, help them to see what they need to see, this is a very important thing. How do I pray for somebody else? You say, Father, I pray for Sister Suba. I pray, Father God, that in the area where she has acted offensively towards me, that, Father, you will forgive her, that you will open up and shine light in her, Lord, concerning her actions that are offensive to you. And whatever you want to change in Sister Suba, you change it to make her the woman you've called her to be. Whatever you want to change in my dad to make him the man he needs to be, Father, change him. Help him to see it. Deliver him from this, this pain that causes him to act in this way. So you're praying for them, not for them to get theirs, but for God to deal perfectly. Say, Father, I release them from my judgment, and I give them to you. You judge them. And, Father, I pray that you'd have mercy on them and reveal to them their error so they can change and be blessed. That's a loving way to pray for somebody. How often do you do it? As long as you're mad at them. You do it every day, every time it comes up. You stop and say, Lord, change them the things you want to change. I make them the person you called them to be. I bless them in Jesus' name. And you just go right on. Lord, I take not that offense. I thank you that that's under the blood of Jesus. I'm not walking in unforgiveness. You judge them. You got them. You handle this, God. I trust you. And you just go on. Every time you think of it, every, just say that prayer. Get a couple of prayers. Whip them out. Doesn't have to be long intercessory meetings. Just quickly say, Father, I, I pray for them. I pray that you bless them. Do, change in them what you want changed. So make them who you've called them to be. In Jesus' name, I'm done. Hallelujah. Somebody comes up to you and says, can you believe what they did to you? Say, you know what? I have chosen to forgive that, and I'm not going to talk about that anymore. I'm not going to remember that. It's not good for me. I'm not pulling the scab open. I've let that go. Well, I can't believe you do that. Well, I, 
Let's talk about something else. Now listen to this. In Job 42, the Bible says that Job was attacked by Satan. He lost his health. He lost his family. He lost his finances. And his wife says to him, you're such a miserable mess, you ought to curse God and die. And it kept going. And Job didn't know where it was coming from. It was the enemy attacking him. And then his friends came, and his friends accused him of doing something to bring this curse. And so at the very end of the book of Job, God finally shows up, and God tells his friends that they were not very good friends, that they were actually wrong in what they had told Job. And then he tells them, listen, uh, what you need to do is you need to go to Job, and you need to ask him to pray for you, or terrible things are going to come on you. You need to bring him an offering and ask for his forgiveness and ask him to pray for you. So they go, and the Bible says that Job accepted their gift and prayed for them. Now, here's what's amazing. The offenders needed to repent in order to free themselves from the judgment that was coming on their lives. But Job needed to pray for those who offended him in order for him to be free from the burden in his life. Listen to this one verse, verse 10, when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him double, twice as much as before. And it goes on to list all of the things God did. When did Job's captivity get turned? When he prayed for his friends. When you pray, and his friends were actually not being very friendly. They were actually had been enemies. They had been speaking hurtful things. But until Job prayed for them, his captivity wasn't turned. Until they did what was right, their captivity wasn't turned. Let God keep the books. From your standpoint, you pray. Say, well, what if they don't repent? Well, in the new covenant, you pray for them anyway. Amen? All right. The second thing he tells us to do is to say something good or bless those that curse you. Blessing is the Greek word eulageo, which means to speak a good word about somebody else. That means when somebody is speaking evil about you, you heard somebody, you know, uh, repeat something about you, maybe you told somebody something and you found out they told somebody else and that you asked them about it and they lied and said they didn't, but they did. How many have ever had that happen, you know? And, and you, you feel angry because people are speaking against you behind your back. Uh, I know a little bit about this. I've had this happen. And, you know, there have been times, how many of you would admit we've sometimes, you know, said things we shouldn't say about others, Right? When you know someone is speaking against you, the Bible gives you an active strategy, a love strategy, Say something good about them. Find something good to say. Something. Everybody say something. And if you're married to somebody, your job is not to expose your husband's faults to your girlfriends or your wife's faults to your guy friends. You talk to them about it. If you need to bring a leader, a minister, a counselor, someone else in, keep it within the circle, but don't expose each other. That's one of the worst things you can do. Yeah, it happens all the time. Christian women complain about their husbands to their girlfriends. It's no wonder the husband becomes resentful. Christian men talk about their wives, talk about them disrespectfully, dishonorably to their guy friends or to others. It's not right. And don't start complaining about your marriage problems with your high school friend that you hooked up with on Facebook. God did not put them in your life to help you through your marriage, especially if they're a member of the opposite sex and you have a little bit of a thing for them. I'm talking to somebody in this house right now. Mm. The third strategy the Lord gives us in Romans 12 is to do something for them. He said, do good to them. Everybody say, do good. The phrase do good is agatheo poeo, which means to practice a good or benevolent act. It actually has the idea of giving somebody something. So you need to look for a way that you can bless that person practically. If they have something broken, offer your services to fix it. Pray for the Lord. If they're in the hospital, go visit them. If you find out something's going on with their family that's been hurtful, send them a nice card and send them a gift or money. You don't even have to let them know it came from you. 
I've had, I've, I've had to practice this in my life, and I'm telling you, when I've really been hurt and offended because someone has acted or done something against me, if I, if I can, I pray the Lord, if he shows me a way that I can be good to them or do something benevolent for them, it's amazing how it, it both heaps coals of fire and snatches coals of judgment. Years ago, I heard about a pastor of another church that was criticizing. I heard it from several people and had been saying some terrible things about me and our church and about, you know, totally just got the wrong idea and uh, was in the middle of a building a church. And their building program had kind of stopped. And there was part of me that was like, yeah, God, don't let them ever get that building finished. <laughs> and the Lord said, son, I want you to forgive him. I said, all right, I forgive him by faith in Jesus' name. And then he said, no, I want you to pray for them. I said, okay, Lord, I bless so-and-so, help them. Changing them what you want changed. You know, and I kind of started getting free. Then he said, now I want you to say something good about them. So I found somebody else. Actually, I came up in church on Sunday. I said, we're going to pray today for such and such a church. They're a great church. And we all prayed for them. We blessed them. I didn't do this for them. I did this because the Bible says to do it. I wasn't hoping they found out about it. I was just doing it because I was having to keep myself free of offense. And then the Lord said, now I want you to send them a big offering. I said, well, what was that last one? He said, yeah, and I want you to participate in it. So I gave, we gave a big offering personally, but then we gave an offering from our church towards our building fund of several thousands of dollars. It was a real big offering at the time for us. And uh, we just sowed it and said, God bless you. Well, later, the pastor called me and said, I can't tell you, he was crying. He said, God, I didn't know you, but he said, when you gave that offering, he said, it, we, we had dried up in our building fund. No more, we had a couple hundred grand to go. No more money was coming in, and we were, our building was half done. When you gave that offering, it was like something got set off in the spirit. I got up and shared it and wept and shared it with the congregation. Suddenly, people began bringing offerings, and he said, it hasn't stopped coming in. We're going to finish this building. He said, your gift was the thing that broke us through, and he and I became friends from that day forward. And I, to my memory, I don't think we ever had a conversation about what I'd heard he had said. And I don't need to, because I forgave it. I'm telling you, if you, why is this important? Because your reward will be megas. Great. It keeps you free. It's not just, Lord, I choose to forgive them. Then, pray for them regularly. Speak good words. If you can't say anything nice, find, if they have nice red hair, say they've got the most beautiful red hair. Find somebody and just say something nice about them. Find something. Just say something. Just do this. Do this. Do this. It'll, it, it takes the thorns of offense and pushes them out. And then find a way to bless them. Ask the Lord for a way to bless them, and he'll show you a way. Maybe you can pay a bill that, they, that you find out that they're having a hard time meeting a bill. Pay a bill for them. The bigger the sacrifice, the bigger the blessing for you. If you can do it privately, do it privately. If the Lord tells you to walk up and hand it to them, hand it to them. Whatever it is, practice these love strategies, and you'll come under the covering of love, which will not only, not only protect you, but it will also snatch coals of judgment off the heads of the people that have been offensive and give them the greatest opportunity to have a turnaround in their life. Have you been blessed by the Word of God today? Praise the Lord.